remember I, I showed you this before, where the uh, various land features are <coughs> and where the, uh, the memorial is. And I also showed you that last meeting. I think it's well worthwhile making the effort to go and have a look at it. Um, so if you're out that way, just go down Peninsula Avenue, Tranby, and uh, turn into Clarkson, and, and you'll find it there. This was the plan put up by uh, a group, and this was a seven metre circle with an outline of an aircraft at ground level, points of the compass, north, south, east and west, a couple of aerodrome lights there, and two introductory plaques at the opening. This is one of the plaques, the red line points to it. There are four groups of four plaques. Not exactly as in the drawing, this was the proposal. So that's it <coughs> on the ground, not on the day, taken at a, another time. These are the two uh, airfield lights. These are the two introductory plaques. There's the outline of the Bristol tour. And here is one set of plaques, another, another, and another. Four images in each. There's a propeller in the centre, and that was donated by Cliff Brown. A lot of people know Cliff. Uh, he passed away about uh, 18 months or so ago. The mayor uh, opened the event and uh, made a very nice and appropriate short speech. There were 40 chairs where 40 people sat down. There was a marquee at the back of that uh, where there were drinks and nibbles um, and another 40 or more people around the, uh, the marquee or in the marquee. Um, following the mayor's talk, uh, Terry Gaunt, who is the president of the Mayland Historical uh, Society, uh, made a speech, uh, got most of it right. Uh, <laughs> he made a couple of references to me which were wrong, so that's why I said that. Um, <laughs> they'd asked Ted Fletcher and I to present the text and the images uh, for the, uh, the plaques, the 16 of them. So there are some of the plaques, of course Norman Brealey, Horry Miller, Charlie Snook and Jimmy Woods, organisations, Western Australian Airways, Robinson Norton Airlines, ANA, Royal Australian Air Force and the Royal Aero Club. You'd be interested to know, maybe, that of these organisations, there's only two still exist. The Royal Australian Air Force and the Royal Aero Club of Western Australia. All the others have flown the coop. Miscellaneous plaques, there were there was one there to the aircraft that flew from Mayland, a range of aircraft. Visitors, famous visitors, Maylands at war, early operators, individuals who operated out of them, and uh, agricultural operators. There's one missing, I've forgotten what it was. That's the Aero Club plaque. What happens when you hand these things over to organisations to uh, do the job for you? If you go out there, you'll find that that is Marylands. <laughs> Got it. But spell checkers uh, really control the world, don't they? Uh, so they, that's the Aero Club plaque, and the others are very similar to that. And that's Kevin Bailey in his Tiger Moth. We asked Kevin to overfly, and we couldn't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin doesn't get into controlled airspace very often because his Tiger Moth doesn't have the right equipment on board. So when you made the request and got it, he made the most of it. He asked to operate below 1,500, and there he is at 300. <laughs> he didn't tell anyone how far under 1,500 he was going to go. He said he went up the river and enjoyed it so much he thought he'd turn around and come back again. The gentleman, Terry Gaunt, making the speech was interrupted, but he wasn't upset at all. 
Then the aircraft turned around and came back again <laughs> up the river for a third pass. Then it turned and came for a fourth pass. At every occasion, people were shouting, cheering, waving their arms. It couldn't have gone down better. Kevin, thank you very much. <laughs> I was so impressed that I went up to the mayor and said that was magnificent. Double what we even hoped for. I said, I think you should double the ante. They promised to give Kevin some money for fuel. So I said, how about you double it? And the mayor said, no worries. <laughs> and he was pretty pleased too. Something that came up <clears throat> on the day, Terry Gaunt, told me the exact path that the Kitty Hawks took from Maylands to Fremantle. You may remember about 18 months ago I gave a talk on the Kitty Hawks and uh, I didn't know the exact route that they took. Well, <coughs> Terry was able to tell me that they left Maylands, Peninsula Road, Guildford Road. They did go under the Mount Lawley subway. I was told specifically that they did not go under the Mount Lawley subway. If they didn't, they had to use East Parade. So I was working down East Parade. I was told that they went past Wellington Square, but they didn't. They did go into the subway. They went down Lord Street and turned west into Newcastle Street. In Newcastle Street, they turned into Stirling Street. This would take them down to the Sunday Times newspaper and the Shaftesbury Hotel. A little twist there, Atwood Motors was in that complex as well and over the Beaufort Street Bridge and down Barrack Street. So that's the exact route that was taken. They then turned in a Mounts Bay Road and Mounts Bay Road down to Fremantle. They loaded onto the, uh, the ship and over that evening and the ship left the next day on the 22nd of February. The Janicot comparison. I worked for the Lands and Surveys Department and drew the contours of this site in 1957. <laughs> At that stage, <coughs> the department had cleared a strip of land in this area and they had some different grass types there and they were going to experiment with the grass types and fertilisers and eventually uh, the idea was to have grass strips uh, but it didn't work. They decided they'd have to have something else. So let's see what's happened in the meantime. That's it. That grass strip is about there. I've heard stories that the crop dusters used to empty their tanks and that was a good place for it to go. Well, so while the department was trying to work out what was happening to their their grass strip, <laughs> and operators were public. Right. Okay, so if we just go back to that, um, this is the runway up here to the uh, Compass Swinging Bay, and out this side, got that right? Yep. Uh, out here to the airplane washing area. Anyway, that's where the grass strip was. There's a remnant of the grass strip in about 1965. This could be 1964. So you come in along this road, turn, come up the hill to the tower, down the hill, and there's the parking area, which we're having a lot of fun with at the moment. There's the Euro Club there. Taken from the north is the Compass Swinging Bay, the wash area, down here, and then down there to the Royal Aero Club. Once again, you drive in here, turn the corner, up the hill to the tower, there, on down to the Aero Club. The parking area hasn't been finished. There's still sand there. That was the tower. That was the view from the tower. After you passed the tower today, you would have driven down this road and turned to the right into the car park there. That's the Aero Club building there. That's the Aero Club hangar under construction in about 1964. That's the Aero Club hangar in 1965. And so that's what it's like today. And the back of the hangar, down the bottom, has changed to that. 
that's the firehouse. Uh, we used to have fire trucks. There's none in there at that time. There's none in there now. Toilets. <coughs> there weren't many around, so the federal government gave us a toilet out in the middle of nowhere. BP installation, you passed it on the way in every time you come to this club. Been a few changes there. Milodo Sutherland operated the hangar next door. Uh, it turned into Silver Flying School, Silver Flying <coughs> Services, Air Flight are currently in that building. The anemometer out in the centre, the Royal Flying Dr. Hangar, yes, that's it. <coughs> the powerhouse at the foot of the tower, Simpson Aviation down the bottom turned into uh, West Australian Aviation and Transwest and the Cessna Agency. That's what the uh, place looked like in about 1970. You'll notice that the Aero Club had a small building and its hangar was there. Limited parking, just straight down there is this park area here. And so that's how it turned out in 2000. And since then, in this area here, the clearing has taken place and Janigot Airport Holdings are doing everything they can to make money out of that and put nothing into this. They've even proposed that a second runway be built across there and if an aircraft has an engine failure on the part, departure to the west, uh, that's where we are and uh, could be difficult. So, not a lot of cooperation. 